Hello, and welcome to Shelf Life from the Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Jane Kulo, director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us for Are There Murders in the Building? A couple of notes before I hand the program over to our speakers. Please share any your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from a local bookseller or check out a copy from your library, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore the schedule of upcoming programs and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Thank you to Ting for supporting our virtual programming. Our authors today are participating from Virginia, England, and India. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's moderator, Leon Saporin. Leon's short stories have appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, Women's World, and numerous anthologies. She is a member of Mystery Writers of America and Sisters in Crime, and she lives in Charlottesville. Thank you all for joining us for Shelf Life. Over to you, Leon. Thank you, Jane, and welcome readers. Uh, as Jane mentioned, my name is Leon Saporin, and I'll be moderating today's panel with three mystery authors. We'll be chatting about the mystery genre, how they develop their plots, and the role setting plays but we also want to hear from you. So please submit your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom. Let's meet each author. Maggie Blackburn is the author of Once Upon a Seaside Murder. She also writes under her real name, Molly Cox Bryan. And since I know Molly, I'm gonna be referring to her as Molly throughout the panel. Molly's books have been finalists for the Agatha Award, the Daphne du Maurier Award, and named a top 10 beach read by Woman's World. Welcome, Molly. And would you read the opening of Once Upon a Seaside Murder? Sure. Even though Hildy Merriweather's heart was pagan, she loved Christmas. It thrilled her to tell anybody who asked why it didn't conflict with her goddess-loving pagan ways. As we practice Christmas today, it has very little to do with the birth of Christ, she'd say. In fact, the Christmas tree, the holly, all of it has pagan roots in the solstice. As far as historians can tell, Christ was born in April and his birthday was tacked onto the solstice in celebration as a sneaky way of getting pagans to convert, she'd say. And then she'd offer you the best vegan brownie you'd ever eaten. Disarming? Yes. But that was Hildy, Summer's mother, and she was all about peace, love, and stardust, but she was gone. Summer drew in a breath as she walked in the sand. The sound of the ocean had always soothed her ever since she was a child. Christmas without her mother. She didn't know how she'd get through it, but get through it, she must. Very appropriate for this time of year. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Amita Murray, author of Arya Winters and the Tiramisu of Death, is based in London by way of Delhi and California. She's had writer residencies with University College London and Plymouth University and taught advanced fiction at the University of East Anglia. Welcome, Amita. And would you read the opening of Arya Winters and the Tiramisu of Death? Thank you. Thank you, Leon. I'd love to. Loneliness killed my auntie Mira. It wasn't a stranger that she inadvertently let into her house. It wasn't a burglar or an unknown lover. None of these possibilities point to the true reason that she died a few months ago at the age of 61 murdered in her, in her own home, left naked and splayed on her kitchen floor. On a January morning, when snowflakes sang arias outside her window and robins hopped on frosted branches of holly. It was loneliness. People think it's only unfriendly people who are lonely, the ones who are rude and obnoxious, 
the ones who push others away. But that isn't true. Nice people are often the loneliest, people who do and say nice things, who step aside to let others pass, the ones who open doors and thank people, who smile and act as if everything is fine, whose smiles hide the fact that they believe deep down inside that no one will catch them if they fall. Those people, I think, the ones who are unfailingly nice, those are the ones that are most in danger of ending up like Auntie Miro. Thank you, Amita. That theme of isolation really resonates after the last year and a half uh, for all of us, I think. R.V. Raman is the author of the New York Times Editor's Choice book, A Will to Kill and a Dire Isle, as well as the Inspector Renate and Inspector Druvi thrillers, which are loosely based on his own corporate career. Welcome, R.V. Thank you. Would, Lovely to be here. And would you read the opening of your book, A Will to Kill? Sure. So here goes. The visitor was ill at ease fidgeting with his watch's metal strap, locking and releasing the clasp repeatedly. He had made two attempts to convey the message he was carrying, but had pulled up short both times. Across the table at Chennai's New Woodland Hotel, Harit Atreya waited, studying the willowy young man who had given his name as Manu Fernandez. The sealed envelope Manu had brought remained unopened on the table beside a steaming tumbler of filter coffee. Manu had just invi invited Atreya to his family mansion in the Nilgiris on his father's behalf and was ineffectively trying to pass along the rest of the message. Thank you, RV. And we'll talk about what was in that envelope uh, later in this panel. Um, so if all the authors could make sure they are on screen so everybody can see uh, all three of you. Uh, Molly, great. All right, so uh, a question really common to all of you is has to do with the subgenres of mysteries. Uh, when you say mystery, that includes things from psychological suspense to thriller to uh, a, a traditional or cozy mystery. And your books, all of them, could be considered at least partially in the cozy mystery genre. And what do you agree? And in what ways do you think your books fit that genre? And in what ways do they defy it? And Molly, I'm gonna start with you because Summer, your main character, has assumptions about cozy mysteries some of which turn out not to be true. And can you talk about that? Um, yes, Summer is, a, I mean, this book really squarely fits in the cozy mystery genre. Um, uh, and Summer herself is a bit of a book snob. Um, at the, in the first book, um, you know, she's a Shakespeare professor. In the first book, she ends up loving romances. And in this book, I think she ends up loving cozy mysteries. Um, but she does assume that um, they're they're not very meaty and um, that every all the crimes are all wrapped up too too quickly and um, which some you know some sometimes that's true. Um, so uh, the ways that uh, this mystery might be a little bit different is that Sama herself is sometimes not very likable. Um, you um, she is a little prickly sometimes and but you know she does have her soft side and this book is about a um a closed case a, a cold case and most cozy mysteries don't focus uh on cold cases so that's where it differs but it does have the amateur sleuths uh the small town setting a bookstore setting so those are very much all cozy mystery elements um, and you talk about not a totally likable character, and that makes me think a little bit of Arya Winters. And I, so I wanted to know, Amita, if you had a comment on that. 
Yes, um, I, I I liked the things that Maggie said about um, you know what what makes her book kind of fit into the cozy genre, and I agree with those that um, similarly Aria Winters you know it's it, it has a small kind of villagey setting, so that that's kind of true to the cozy genre. Um, it has a baker who is an amateur sleuth, so you know she bakes uh, Halloween Halloweeny desserts. So th there you go for the cozy mystery. Uh, there's a romantic element, there's uh, lots of characters, quirky characters in the village, so those, I think those features do kind of fit into the, uh, into the cosy genre, but I have to say that having not thought about this at all when I was writing it, but then since having it published, I've, I've, I've heard it again and again, that, uh, you know, that there is there is a character that isn't entirely likable, so that's Ari Winters, and she herself says, you know, not a lot of people like me because she's very blunt. You know, she says she's very forthright. She she tends to tell you the, you know, to tell you what she thinks, uh, even if you don't want to know what that is. Um, if she doesn't want to talk to you, she will let you know that she doesn't want to talk to you. And so, so there's that kind of edgy element to her. Um, but you know, the biggest thing that people tell me is there's too much sex in this for a cozy mystery. So uh, <laughs> Mag Maggie's laughing at that one. Um, yeah, but so I- came I, up with a unique way around being explicit about that. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. I mean, I wasn't too explicit about kind of some of it, some of the sexy elements, but there is obviously it, the the fun sex is is a little bit more explicit than than some of the gory gory side of things. So um, you know, there is there this the sort of the flea bag attitude to sex. There is uh, there is that that you don't normally find perhaps in a, in a cozy mystery quite as much. Uh, the vulnerability of sex, the getting it wrong, the getting it right, the the desire side of things. So yes, there, there's a sort of a mix of cozy and not so cozy elements. Uh, RV, could you talk about how your book uh, fits or doesn't fit? Uh, one way in which it seems to fit is the locked room mystery, but if you could talk first about your main character since we're talking about our protagonist here. Sure. So as a background, it's a story about uh, an elderly man who is, uh, who is being threatened by a number of people and uh, he has, people have tried to kill him before. And that is why he calls Atreya. Now the setting is a remote valley. Uh, you can't imagine a, a place more rural than that, remote valley. Uh, all the characters are there in an old colonial mansion and a landslide takes place. So as a result, everybody who's inside in the valley are cut off. So to that extent, it's a very close community. So, which is one of the features of, of uh, Cozy Mysteries. Uh, the other feature is that the protagonist, the sleuth, uh, he is a likable person and most of the others are also likable people. The other feature of, I think all my writing is that uh, my writing tends to be very clean. I, I don't use swear words, I don't use profanities. So I'm a little bit of the old school. Uh, so to that extent, it fits into the cozy category. Where it doesn't is that the sleuth, although he's a nice guy, he is an ex-police officer. He is a retired police officer, which is not necessarily uh, the case in most uh, cozy uh, mysteries. And in the background, there is a ghost. And I don't know how many, uh, how many cozy mysteries have ghosts. And there is one character who comes in in the middle, who's from outside the valley, who is a, who's reputed to be an assassin, a killer. So he uh, he's added to the mix. So this is how partly my book is cozy, partly it is not. Um, your books all include, Maggie, you mentioned cold crimes. Your book all, books all include an element of past crimes. RV, could you talk about the role of that in your book first? Yeah. Now, the main crime that takes place is very much in the present. Uh, there are two murders that take place very much in the present. There, in the background, there are some old crimes. Some of it is murder, some of it is some other thievery. Now, the role those play is in providing the motive. So beyond that, there isn't as much a long shadow from the past. Uh, so to provide a very strong motive, which comes as a surprise towards the end. Uh, the um, uh, sorry, 
sorry, it's just not still there. <clears throat> Well, I'll, I'll ask all three of you, um, um, and RV, you're on mute. I'll ask all three of you, you all have a past crime and a present crime in your books. So I'm curious, which did you start with, the one in the present and then tie it to the past or the other way around, Amita? Um, what would you say? Yeah, uh, you know, the I, I wrote the first page just as I read it today. So it was to me, you know, it did start where, where the book now starts. Um, but that's how I started writing it. I think one of the big things about mysteries that I absolutely adore is the psychological motive to the crime. You know, I really like that. I, I really like, I, I'm not so good at the spies and the, uh, the, the, the sort of the big, the big um, you know, the big plot or the assassins or the, I'm not very good at that kind of stuff. I, I, I like the psychological motive behind the crime. I like to trace it back to, you know, what, what, what happened to this person that they became like this. Um, so I do, I do tend to dwell on that a bit. Um, and because of that, I also wanted Aria to have a motive to jump into this. You know, why why does she um, why does she care about solving this crime? And I think it helped me to understand that um, when she could tie what happens in in the next couple of days in the book, there, there there is a crime, and she kind of follows that and tries to solve it. But for her, it, it's because she links it to, to something that happened to her auntie uh, and she links those two crimes. And for me, that was quite a, that was quite a strong pull for me. You know, I can understand then why someone would get roped into looking into a crime because normally perhaps, uh, you know, we wouldn't. Uh, yeah, so that was my, my way of kind of, you know, bringing it all together. But the other thing it was, I was kind of, really thinking about loneliness and uh, to me Auntie Mira was a lonely person and so there there was the thread that links a lot of things in the book. Mm -hmm. Molly? Well uh, I, it was definitely uh, you know I thought about the cold case first when I was writing this book. Um, the, uh, the other crime that takes part I think it takes place is linked to that in the modern day, but um, it's not as relevant, I think, to the book as the, the past crime. And I'm with Amita on this where, um, and the longer I write mysteries, and I think this is my 18th or 19th book, I, I, I don't know, but um, the more the psychology of everything really fascinates me. And um, I think this, a lot of what this book is about is how um, Summer is dealing with her mother's murder as, and then finding out that her mother had this fascination with a cold case, um, which is so much unlike her mother, and then finding out the link and why she was fascinated. Um, there's a lot about how murder trickles down through the generations and how it affects everybody um, through this book. So I think that's what I was trying um, to get at by, by writing the cold case. RV, following up on Maggie's comment about murder trickling down through the generations, how would you say that plays out in your book? It does, um, but to start with, uh, when I visualized the story, it was very much the present day crime. Uh, when the book starts, it looks like a fairly plain vanilla inherent, inheritance driven murder uh, or inheritance driven motives. Then as you get into the mansion and meet the people, then you see that there is art and antiques to come to play. And many of them are from uh, old times, many of them are from Europe, they are from Vienna, from Germany. Uh, so then there is more complexity that comes in. And when you look at it, the past about 12 to 14 years, few other crimes were created where uh, had taken place in, um, uh, in Europe, although the, uh, the, uh, my story is set completely in India, the past crimes are in Europe and they are art related. And that's, that motive starts coming out a little later. And then some of the people, some of the characters in the book turn out to be people who they don't, they, 
uh, are not what they claim to be. And that's a common theme too, people not what they appear to be. Um, so uh, RV, staying with you for a moment, when you read the opening, there was an envelope on the table that had not yet been opened, but it's opened very early. So I don't think it's a spoiler to talk about what's in it. Would you tell us what's in it? Because it's, it's an unusual uh, device that you've used. So in the envelope is a letter which has been written by the old man. His name is uh, Bhaskar Fernandez. Now, Bhaskar has had a very checkered history and he's the lord and master of this huge mansion in the hills. <clears throat> so he writes to Atreya and says, listen, I have been a very, I've been a great fan of crime fiction as well as nonfiction. And it would be great if you could come over to my place and spend a few days where I can talk to you and try and tap your experience in, in crimes. Atreya, for, uh, as a background, is, a, is an extremely experienced investigator. He was there, he was with the Indian police for about uh, 30 years or so. So that is this thing that links these two elderly gentlemen, that is crime, fiction as well as nonfiction. And then as the book goes on, there are other aspects that come in. The, the two wills, for example, which I won't go into detail, but there. Um, Amita, you said uh, earlier that you started with the opening that you read to us and then the rest of the story came from there. So what um, inspired you to write uh, such a poignant discussion of loneliness? Well, I, I'm weird. I think about loneliness a lot, you know, uh, it, it was sometimes when I'm feeling lonely and other times when I'm not, but I, I find, I, you know, like Aria, I find um, that we do tend to use politeness sometimes as a way of, you know, keeping people at a distance. Uh, and I think that's not something that we are always aware of because politeness or being nice or being charming is seen as something good. You know, it's seen as a good thing that, that it facilitates kind of social relationships to, to, to develop and evolve. But I, I, I often think that how many times do we say the polite thing instead of how we are actually feeling? You know, if we're feeling really rubbish on a, on a particular day, how many times are we going to say, I feel really rubbish instead of saying, uh, fine, great, you know, I'm going to go play tennis later or whatever, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, um, uh, I, I just wonder how much, how much we keep ourselves in little sort of lonely bubbles um, because we are being polite and because we're doing the, the right social thing. Um, and I like Aria because, you know, it's a weird thing to say about your own character, but she, to me, she's a separate person from me uh, and I want to be like her, you know, I, I want I want to be the kind of person who can just say what's on their mind um, because I, I will many times do the polite thing and say the thing that the social situation needs or requires. Um, not, not always, uh, you know, I'm getting better at it, better at not doing that, but I, I like that Aria doesn't sort of play though by those rules that that we think are important um she wants to be accepted you know for who she is and if if that's not possible then she she will push people away and even though that keeps her lonely uh she still thinks that that's a better bargain than uh than pretending to be who she's not and being lonely for that reason um so i guess i think yeah i think i think about it a lot and i have to say in the last year uh, I've heard people talk a lot about loneliness, isolation, social anxiety, much more than perhaps we used to. Uh, you know, we, we've we've thought about what it what it what it is that uh, that we crave, and you know, the the, the connection we crave with other people, uh, much more in the last year or so, last couple of years now. So I, I think it's very relevant to a lot of us, um, perhaps in a way that I didn't even think when I was writing it, but feels very very important for all of us to be able to talk about now. I, that, that's so true. I, I do think, you know, that this uh, loneliness was emerging as a theme even before because um, characters in mysteries that are uh, socially awkward or, or more socially direct have, have been more common. Uh, for example, Sarah Grand's Claire DeWitt, who, you know, is a little bit like Arya Winters, 
Um, there are a couple of mysteries with autistic characters who for those reasons are very direct. So it seems like we're seeking characters who maybe are not so polite and, and uh, pull back the facade. Um, Molly, I, and your book combines two very disparate themes. Shakespeare, because your main character is a Shakespeare professor, and you also have Muslim culture. And I noticed in previous books of yours, because I've read them, you've brought in themes before, whether it's immigration or other issues. So uh, two questions, I guess. One is, how did you think to combine two such different themes? And two, what, what leads you to bring in these issues into your, your cozy mysteries? Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, when I first started writing Cozy Mysteries, I, I guess I didn't understand um, that, you know, you were supposed to stay away from certain issues or bring in diversity, or, you know, that was years ago, of course. Um, so I uh, started reading my reviews and seeing that, you know, people didn't quite like some of the edgier elements. And so I um, used the tagline, you know, uh, I write cozy mysteries with edge. Um, so uh, I, I wasn't thinking about mixing the Shakespeare and the Muslim culture um, because Summer is already a Shakespeare professor. And so that's all sort of solidified in the first book. Um, but to me, I guess they kind of, you know, um, the Muslim culture is so rich, just like, um, Shakespeare and, and, and literature. I mean, the literature from uh, the Muslim culture is, you know, incredible. So um, I guess they work together. They seem to. Um, and I do like, I do enjoy um, uh, getting in there and um, bringing out some issues that people might not want to talk about or feel uncomfortable about. I, I think it's important. I think uh, as writers, I mean, not all writers like to do that, but as writers, I think one of our jobs is maybe to make people think a little bit differently. I, yeah, the best combination is to both entertain and enlighten. And if you can hit that, you really, yeah. you really hit it. So, um, and, and talking about kind of bringing in elements that that were not brought in before. RV, I, I, I know that you are an admirer of Locked Room Mysteries and what made you decide to have one set in India? Well, that's a slightly long story in the sense that when I was a schoolboy, uh, of course, we used to read a lot of fiction and uh, India has a lot of stories, be it epic, epics, fairy tales, uh, love stories, war stories, a lot, right? But there was one genre that was missing, which is the whodunits. The mystery, murder mysteries were very, very few. So we would read the Christie's and Conan Doyle's and uh, Earl Stanley Gardner's of this world, but we didn't have very many uh, Indian authors who wrote uh, uh, murder mysteries. That actually continues till today. Uh, it's not just books, it's also films. There are very, very few Indian films which do well, which are about uh, murder mysteries. For some reason, uh, murder mysteries are not consumed very well uh, in India. Even today, uh, it's difficult to sell one. So going back, when I was reading those uh, uh, books from uh, Christie and Conan Doyle and others uh, when I was a kid, I always longed for something like that, which is set in an environment which I knew that is India and couldn't find me. Uh, so I did contemplate the possibility of writing one, but I had absolutely no confidence of doing that. And then years passed, decades passed, and then when I was approaching 50, when I crossed 50, I decided, let me take a shot at it. And uh, that's what became a win ticket. So you, you saw a need and pushed the envelope there as well. And what, what is your connection to the setting, the Nilgiri Mountains? Uh, you know, tell us about the setting and, and how you came to choose it. Okay. So uh, in this series of murder mysteries, I intend to take the readers to different parts of India. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm, I've just about started writing the fourth. So each one of them goes to uh, takes the reader to different places. 
The first one was set in a colonial mansion in the hills, which is a very, very typical golden age kind of uh, setting. And one has read so many of those uh, golden age books that when I was thinking about the setting for the first one, uh, I said, I'm going to do it in an old colonial mansion. Of course, I could have set it wherever where I wanted. The other thing was, before writing this one, I had written four other crime, uh, crime thrillers. And I hail from a place called Chennai uh, in a state of Tamil Nadu. And one of the feedback I, I was getting was that you live in that part of the world and you haven't set one of your stories there. So I decided to set this one, the set this colonial mansion in the hills of Tamil Nadu. And that's how what I read out the first page, it starts in Chennai. So that's the history behind it. Okay. So you have a deeply personal connection to the setting. Um, so uh, Molly and Amita, do you have a personal connection to your setting? Uh, Molly first. Um, well, I can tell you how the book was, how the series was inspired. It was, I um, was on a beach vacation with a girlfriend um, and we had no children with us, nor did we have husbands. So um, it was her mother's condo. So we didn't even have to pay for the condo. And it was just a wonderful vacation. We did what we wanted. We didn't have to answer to anybody. And I said, you know, this is just paradise. The only thing that is missing is a bookstore um, that we could just walk to and, and browse and buy books. And so that's how this series um, started for me was, was imagining a, um, a dream of a bookstore, which is what Beach Reads, Reach, Beach Reads is. It's, you know, it has free coffee, free tea all day long. It's got beautiful local artwork and it's got two uh, levels. One has a balcony that looks out over the ocean. So um, that's how it started for me. So, and which is very different for me because a lot of my books are set locally in Virginia. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Sounds like it. Amita. Well, I do live uh, sort of just uh, just on the outskirts of London, so there is that personal connection. Um, I like the fact that it's so close to sort of central London, and yet you have the woods, and there's quite a lot of uh, you know out, outside spaces and green spaces. So I like that. But I think the biggest thing about it is perhaps that you know, there, sh there should be something quite ideal about a setting like that if you live there where everyone knows you and, and you know, they know your name and they, they recognize you. And yet for Aria, it's those very features that are claustroph claustrophobic for her, you know, so she finds, oh, I don't know, she wants to belong and yet she finds it very, very difficult to belong. Uh, she has this craving to, to be accepted and loved and yet you know, the, the, the very fact that people know her and want to talk to her and want her to be involved in stuff is something that she really, really, you know, had barriers against. So um, in, a, in a sense, that that feeling of wanting to be close to people and yet not being able to be close to people, I think uh, it was a good setting for that. And I'm, I'm, again, while I've traveled so much, um, I'm not as good at, you know, again, the kind of the big uh, flashy locations where you travel a lot and you go uh, first to Germany and then to China and then to somewhere else, you know, it'd be cool if I could, but I'm better at kind of the cozy, the psychological, the, the you know, the, the kind of simmering underbelly of what's going on just locally uh, to people that just look sort of like anyone else. Uh, so that, that's what attracts me, I think, to, to those kinds of locations. Well, the contained closed setting, which is so common to cozy mysteries, does lend itself more to a, a deeper psychological, you know, analysis and interaction. So, um, and another element of cozy mysteries, which is somewhat related to that, is that there are often quirky characters. I think one of you, I think Molly, you mentioned that at the beginning of the panel. So, you know, what quirky characters for any of you would you want to highlight? secondary characters in your books? Yeah, um, I mean, quirky characters. I love quirky characters. I, it, that's what draws me to writing. I, you know, I, I also, this is why I'm no good at writing something 
gothic i love reading gothic i when i heard about maggie's uh, kind of daphne daphne du Maurier, uh, uh you know side of things I, I i was really excited about that because i love that genre but i can't write it because i my mind always goes to quirky and sort of the, the witty side of things or the the humorous side of things so it's it's difficult for me to write something sort of haunted quirky characters are so important i mean i like uh you know in the characters in the village there's uh of course there's aria but there's the next door neighbor who's really needy and uh kind of you know wants to she always when she sees aria she has she's has these two conflicting um needs one is to tell her off for not joining in with anything so she's always saying you know aria we we invite you to things and you always just say no what, what's that about and so she says that but at the same time when she bangs the door in her face she opens it and says oh do you want a cup of tea uh you know so she's very needy she really does again want to connect with aria and aria is just holding her at arm's length but the one again the one two okay two other ones that i love veronica chives who's american she makes frozen yogurt and sells frozen yogurt. I love her. Uh, she's just upfront about her sexuality, about her sexual needs. You know, she um, she she's really just a. I like I like Veronica. You know, she's so uh, she's so unabashed. You know, she's not she's not shy um, about about expressing her needs and uh, and her wants. And so I like that about Veronica. And then there is the nearly hundred year old Olga, who I also love. Um, who he's always talking about assassins and how she got away from them and how uh, she, uh, you know, about Russia and the Ukraine. And she's always sort of talking about, uh, you know, when I when I murdered that general in, you know, when I was young and she's like a hundred years old. So it, it's a great sort of quirky character in my mind. I want to know Olga. Uh, yeah. So I love quirky characters. Well, well, on the neighbor, you know, you talked about her conflicting needs, you know, to push Arya away and to reach out, which is mirrors Arya's own situation, right? Of wanting to belong and pushing away. So they're kind of, uh, you know, um, perfectly matched as a dance. You know, if they were on Dancing with the Stars, they'd be doing great together. <laughs> You, you've, you've identified a very cool thing, actually. I, Aria needs to think about that a lot. If she'd be horrified if you said that she was a bit like Mrs. Sharma, she would she would just be horrified uh, because she's always keeping her at arm's length. So that's a really astute thing to say. Thank you. Well, you've got some quirky characters in, in your series. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do. I have Glads who um, has, has decided that she's going to cover all of her body with wildflower tattoos. Um, and she helps solve the crimes. Um, and then, you know, Summer's uh, family is full of quirky characters, but I think I'd like to bring up something that's in a lot of cozy mysteries, and it's in this one, definitely in several of mine, which is the, the animals. Um, I have a bird, uh, Mr. Darcy, in this uh, book, who um, is, uh, I, I mean, I don't know whether this is something I should be proud of or not, but a lot of people say that's their favorite character <laughs> is Mr. Darcy. Um, so um, he, he's, he's an interesting bird. He is definitely grieving the loss of Hildy through the first book. Um, and I don't think that we think of animals as doing that, but they, they certainly do. So um, yeah, it's, it's um, for me, I love writing animals. And um, so I wanted to bring that up. Mm -hmm. RV, what do you what would you say is the most who would you say is the most unusual character in your books? I think Vasca Fernandez, who's the patriarch of the family, is probably the most unusual for a couple of reasons. One is he's had, like I said, he's had a very checkered past. And he was a go-getter, full of energy, all kinds of things, but he lost his legs. And after that, he was uh, he is wheelchair bound. Despite being in a wheelchair, he probably moves around the estate at a far higher pace than anybody else. So he moves around, zooms, rides it like a missile, uh, a man full of energy, full of enthusiasm. And he's the guy somebody is trying to kill. So he comes up with this idea of two wills. He says, listen, somebody is trying to kill me for, for the inheritance. Uh, so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to write two wills which are dated and signed exactly the same. And if I, the, here is one will which comes into effect if I die naturally. Here is another will which comes into effect if I'm killed. 
Now, the first one is public knowledge. His, uh, his nieces, nephews, everybody knows about it, but nobody knows what's in the second will if he's killed. So this was something which um, was interesting for me because all the cozy mysteries and other traditional mysteries we have uh, talked about uh, read, there is this question of which is the latest will? Is there another will that has been written that we do not know of? So I was thinking about that and said, let's push the envelope and say, what if there were two wills which were written, signed, dated, time exactly the same? And I reached out to a couple of my lawyer friends and gave them this question and said, what would happen? Of course, there's no precedent to that. Uh, they said, as far as the law is concerned, I think it will stand because there is a very, in both of them, in both cases, there are very clear conditions under which one uh, particular will will work or over the other. So that he's an interesting character, Bhaskar. Yeah. And that, that approach with the two valid, equally valid wills was very interesting as well. Uh, I'm gonna move, we've, we've talked about your books and I'm gonna move to discussing your writing process and your publishing journey. But first again, I wanna remind the audience that you can ask questions in the Q&A um, tab at the bottom and uh, for any or all of the authors. So um, RV, you had talked about somewhat about your writing journey and about the fact that uh, these mysteries don't sell well in India or haven't until now, I think maybe. Um, so can you talk about your publishing journey um, and how you, you know, how it all came about? Okay. Um, as I said earlier, I, I, I started writing when I was 50. So before that I did not write. Uh, <clears throat> My, my writing, interestingly, did not start with crime fiction. It started with fantasy. When my children were in school, and they are great fans of the Lord of the Rings, so they wanted to create a universe of their own. So the three of us sat after dinner for several days and came up with our own world. And uh, this world existed in our heads, nowhere else. So they said, Dad, why don't you write something about it? So I wrote one scene. It was just a simple for a sword fight between some guys. And then they liked it. So then it became the next scene, the next scene, then the previous scene. That ended up becoming a series of four novels, uh, totaling about half a million words, So which I self-published. There is no market for that here. Once I did that, I said, OK, I can write. I, I, I thought I couldn't write. So something I can write. So let me start with my favorites. Uh, crime fiction. I wanted to write a Christie or a Pan and Doyle kind of a thing. But honestly, I feel that uh, a murder mystery is more difficult to write because the logic and the clues have to fit very well. It's far easier to write a thriller. So I ended up writing four thrillers, which are based on my experience in the corporate world. So once I did that, and I had the confidence that I can pull it off, I took a shot at writing this. And that's how we'll, we'll do it happen. It's an interesting story of self-discovery helped along by your children. Yeah, so. exactly. Molly, tell us about your publishing journey, not just with this series, because this is not your first series by any means. Uh, yeah. Um, I uh, started off as a journalist um, and moved into the specialty of food journalism. And I um, wrote cookbooks. And uh, my agency was always looking for um, fiction authors. And I had an idea that I pitched to them. And my first book was uh, Scrapbook of Secrets. Uh, that's the one that was up for the Agatha Award. And it's a series of scrapbooking sleuths. Um, and I, I guess I would say uh, that I've been writing probably my whole life. I've been telling stories since before um, I could actually physically write. And um, so, you know, um, I guess, and for a period of years, I was writing probably two or three books a year. I'm no longer doing that. Um, now I have a full-time job and I have to uh, get up early in the morning uh, before I go to work um, in order to write. So that has slowed me down a little bit. I just need one huge hit. <laughs> <laughs> it's one huge hit and then I won't have to do the nine to five people okay 
<laughs> but I do love my job. I must say, I, I love my job. It's it just interferes with your writing. So. Yeah, it just interferes with my writing. That's all. So but I mean, now, yeah, I think every part of your life, you just kind of have to fit it in. When my girls were little, when they went to school, that's when I wrote. And now they're off and I'm working nine to five and I have to write in the morning before, you know, so I think you just have to fit it in where you can. Well, your job, or at least your former job, is, has influenced your writing because I think maybe it was your journalism that led you to bring some of these issues, you know, immigration or. I think so. I think you're right. And so it all relates, doesn't it? So. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. Amita, tell us your publishing journey. I relate to some of the things that. Maggie was saying actually, um, because I feel like there are, you know, there are two sides of me, one the very social, sociable one, and uh, I sound like Aria now, uh, and one the one that's very um, private and wants to just sit by themselves and write. And the person that wants to sit by themselves and write sometimes wins and I let go of the other things a little bit and I go into my world and I go, oh, you know, I don't need other jobs, I can just carry on writing and then I'll do the two to three books a year that Maggie's talking about and kind of exploring ideas and experiments but then the sociable side of me the one that wants to work with a team and wants to have you know sort of the the thing that I do with other people uh wants to kind of then that wins sometimes um and so then uh, like a, like Maggie at the moment I also I also work um a, a nearly sort of full time and um so I write around that and I've so, you know sometimes that means missing out on sleep when you're really into a book and you really want to kind of get it all out and other times it means uh just feeling quite harassed and uh you know your your head kind of bursting with ideas so I I also tend to balance sort of working at university I, I work um I work at a university as so I've, I've taught creative writing but at the moment I'm doing more staff training and stuff so I do that um and I write um my journey has been really I think again narrowing down on what I want to write, I think, you know, I, I, uh, I have written uh, similar kind of themes before, but in not in a mystery, uh, mystery genre, but more in a sort of an emotional suspense kind of family comedy kind of genre. And I realized that, that wasn't something that I could sustain long term that the, you know, the mist, the quirky mystery with the, with the, the character you know, looking for who she, looking to find out who she is and looking for, for love and getting it wrong. And all those things are really important to me. And I, um, so now I feel like I'm closer to what I want to be doing in, with my writing than I've ever been before. But I think it is a kind of a honing down, letting go of things kind of process that sort of happens cyclically over and over uh, till you till you kind of keep, you know, narrowing it down to what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've, I've, from what I've seen, there are, are two elements of the mystery genre that tend to draw writers. And I'd be curious to hear if, if one or um, the other was what drew you. And one is that it's got a defined structure, at least in the whodunit. You have a crime, you have a detective or an amateur sleuth, and you have then the clues and follow the path to discover uh, the killer. Um, so that defined structure draws some writers to the genre. The other thing that draws them to the genre is a little bit of what you said, Amita, which is the search for justice. You know, the, the order of society has been ripped and we need to restore it. Um, so comments on that. Okay, shall I go first? Please. Okay, I think the second thing that you mentioned is uh, a strong part for me. You open the newspaper in the morning and you see misery. You look out of your window, you see misery. You go out for a walk, you see poverty. At least this is the world I, I live in, right? So there is no justice is, is the sense you get. So part of me wants to create a world in which I can dispense justice. And that happens even in my fantasy. It's not just this... Uh, uh, this genre, but that is very, very strong for me. The other big attraction for me in this genre is uh, the cerebral element, puzzles. So I have always been attracted to them. Uh, so that's the other thing that really I enjoy. Wow. Molly or Mita? Yeah, uh, I am. I. Um, 
Yeah, I agree. I uh, when I when I think back to that first novel, um, it was just crazy. Trying, I was just writing scenes and characters, and I, I I told my agent, I don't know what I'm doing, and I told her a little bit about it, and she said, it sounds like it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And so when she told me it was a mystery, then I had a structure that really helped me pull everything together. So that structure is very, um, it's very important to me. As a person, I'm not a linear person. I don't think linearly, but when I sit down to write, I am very linear. I want that structure. And I I do want justice. You know, I, I know it's it's a sometimes a very uh uh, sad world when when we see what happens and people not getting justice and you know so it's really it's it, it's wonderful to um, at least have that feeling of justice when you're when you're writing the books. Yeah, I mean, I I find uh, there is a little bit of safety in that structure, isn't there? There's a sort of a okay it's going to get sorted out at the end. And even though you don't always know how it's going to get sorted out, that's and that's why you're turning the pages, you know that there is sort of a safety in, in that enclosed kind of structure. And I like that. I'm very character-based, I'm not plot-based. I start with character, I let the character kind of do what they will. Um, and it's the, you know, what? why this character, why have they, done what they did is is a really important puzzle to me um because i none of my characters i hope they're not interchangeable you know they are people in their own right and so why did somebody do this is it, quite an important thing uh for me and uh, so that psychological motivation does really uh set up the plot for me uh, now because i don't think in terms of plot the plot comes as i write so i start with something and i often go back on myself a lot in the first 10 to 30,000 words, I'm kind of going back on myself and making sure I like where my characters are and what they're doing and they're believable. Um, but then after that 30,000 point, I kind of know what I'm doing and the, and the plot ideas keep on falling into place if I'm doing it sort of regularly enough, uh, the writing. So um, I think it's driven by character, but there is a really lovely kind of safety around having that murder mystery structure where I know, uh, you know, that in the end, things will sort of, whether you like the answer or not to the mystery, it will, there will be an answer. Uh, so I quite like the safety of that. Um, I would, uh, you know, I would find it difficult without that. I, I, I struggle then because I'm so character-based and then the plot doesn't easily fall into place unless I have that lovely safety net. Yeah, the circle closes, yeah. Well, as, as this conversation shows, I think writing can reveal a lot you know, and express a lot. So I'm curious as to what family and friends, how they've reacted either to this book or your first book or another book, any interesting stories there to share as we near the end? We're not quite at the end yet. I mean, I, uh, I think for me, um, my family sort of loves that I write. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I feel like I almost have to shut everyone's voices off to be able to write, uh, you know, because if I'm thinking about them too much, or about anyone too much, or about anyone's reaction, I can't exactly write what I want to write. So for but example, once you've written it, scene, so say once that again, it, like, how, for example, when Aria Winters came out, did, how did they react to it? Um, so... <sighs> I think that again, I think it's because it's just come out. Uh, not everyone's read it yet, so there's still, you know, I, I've only just got my copies recently. So what I would say um, is that again, my family also really likes the safe space of the murder mystery, so they really like the humor. I know that some some of them are more comfortable with the sort of the sexy scenes, and others are a bit less comfortable. Like my dad goes a bit quiet when he's read a book of mine that has a sex scene in it, so he never kind of refers to it. He'll just say, "It was interesting," uh, you know, that book. Whereas if it doesn't have uh, that, that that's a sexy element, he'll be like, "Yeah, that, that was great." But if it does, then he gets a little bit quieter about it. You know, he doesn't want to quite talk yeah. about that. Uh, whereas my mom's like, "Oh yeah, I like that one," uh, you know. So it, it, it's I have to shut them off. Uh, so um, and 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 not, um, not pay too much attention to what anyone might think okay. um, when, I'm, when I'm writing, because I feel like, you know, uh, you know that wonderful, you have to write you, uh, in Bird by Bird, that wonderful book, um, the line of you have to 
right to expose the unexposed and I think that's a wonderful way of thinking you know we have to write to expose the unexposed otherwise there's no point writing so I feel like you kind of have to say everyone go away from my brain so I can do what I want to do well um, we are getting close to the end and I don't want to end without hearing what each of you are working on next and um, RV I'll start with you yeah, um, I'm doing two things. I'm writing the fourth Arthraya mystery. I'm just about conceptualizing it. Uh, but what I'm actually writing now is a science fiction. Uh, I've tried fantasy, I've tried thriller, I've tried mystery. So I'm going to do science fiction. Uh, so that's what I'm doing now. You're exploring other genres. Yes. So this is, this is a post-retirement hobby for me uh, to keep myself intellectually occupied. Uh, so I will do varied things. I don't have structure. I don't push myself to do anything because once there is structure, then it becomes like work. Uh, so I want it to be a hobby and I do it just the way I want it to. Well, you're doing well. As a matter of fact, as we talked uh, before the panel started, your latest book was uh, featured in, on, in Crime Reads uh, in that section of Lit Hub. So um, you're, you're doing well. Thank uh, you. Molly, what have, what have you got next? Um, well, I am uh, re-releasing a book of mine that was um, released by a publisher who's no longer in business, um, and I'm going to indie publish it uh, early next year, The Jean Harlow Bombshell. Uh, when it went out of business, I had almost finished the second book in the series, so that will also be coming out, and it's called The Audrey Hepburn Heist, um, and I'm also writing a novella to wrap up uh, my Buttermilk Creek series, uh, which is um, the series with the cows on the cover and uh, features a cheesemaker. So that will all be coming out in the near future. Okay. So more variety, it's a theme here. Amita, what's next for you? Well, I uh, so the lockdown was strangely, uh, I was being very prolific over lockdown. So I wrote the first three novels in the Aria Winters um, series over that period and maybe loneliness you know keeps on coming into it for that reason as well um so i suppose aria winters will keep on going and i'm going i have an idea in mind for book four for that uh, so i'll be working on that uh, there is a tv option for uh, aria winters book one uh, that i that i'm sort of i'm, I'm you know toying with how how, what, how a script writer might deal with it so I, i'm dealing with that at the moment so I've, I've, there you know that's very exciting news um that 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 should be uh, that in the next couple of years hopefully will materialize and become a real thing um and i keep on experimenting with genre as well like with the same kind of witty comedic mystery style but uh, sort of i play with location and um time period so i am exploring you know what 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 non aria thing i might do next uh, and there's a couple of things i've been kind of toying with so more exploration for all of you. So, well, thanks to all of you. It, it's time to wrap things up. So I do want to thank you, uh, Molly slash Maggie, uh, Amita and RV, and also thank everyone who tuned in. Uh, and please consider buying these books from your local bookseller or through the links on vabook.org, VA short for Virginia, book.org. Uh, you can also check out future virtual events and watch past events from the Virginia Festival of the Book um, at vabook.org. So um, it's, it's time to say goodbye. So thanks to all of you for um, watching it. Um, authors, would you like to say a word of goodbye? Just Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Leon, and thank you, uh, Maggie and Arby. Uh, always thanks a pleasure. So much. Yeah, thank you. Nice thank meeting you. Uh, goodbye and good reading. So.